interestingly, um, the, the majority opinion by Rehnquist, which is a great opinion, if you're going to read any opinions I talk about today, read uh, the opinion United States versus Lopez, 1995. It's worth reading. The Rehnquist opinion gives you a, a, a like a 15-page account of this history I just told you in the last 20 minutes. It's really, it really, uh, it'll encapsulate well for you. But Justice Clarence Thomas wrote a very interesting dissent, not dissent, a concurrence. And Justice Thomas says, "Yeah, I concur with the result, but I think we shouldn't just draw a line in the sand. We should draw the line, and then we should start overturning some of these cases of the last 60 years." And there weren't five justices who were willing to agree to Justice Thomas's more principled position. He says, look, if what we are saying is true, then there are a lot of decisions, all going all the way back to 1937, which are incorrect decisions. And we should have the principled resolve to overturn those decisions. Um, I like Justice Thomas. He's a, he's a great justice. And on so many issues, he takes the very principled stand on these issues. Um, OK, so that's Lopez. Now fast forward uh, to Gonzalez versus Reich, 2005. Uh, the state of California has a medical marijuana act that is in conflict with Congress, which allows people to grow marijuana uh, on their, in their homes and then sell it under certain circumstances for a relief of the medical ailment. Uh, and the, this is in violation of the uh, Federal Narcotics Act, and the um, uh, it, again it's challenged. And the federal government goes all the way to the Supreme Court and argues Wicker versus Filbert. They say, look. This is the same thing. You're producing marijuana for home consumption. You know, you'll give it to these cooperatives and stuff, but you're not really selling it on the market in a normal sense. You're, you're producing it to give to people or to sell in very limited circumstances. Uh, so therefore, um, it's like Booker versus, which was never overturned. Booker versus Filbert was never overturned. And the Supreme Court actually agreed. said, yeah, the federal government can regulate that, just like Booker versus Filbert. This is a product of a, of a, of a, of a um, commodity, the production of a, of a grown commodity, uh, kind of like wheat. Not a legal commodity, but it's like what you're the court said, yeah, the federal government can regulate that. So now fast forward to Obamacare. Now we've got another big leap forward, because the federal government is saying, <laughs> Obamacare is saying, that we can force Americans to purchase health insurance. This is totally unprecedented. Never before has the American, has the federal government, forced Americans to purchase anything, period. Never before has this happened. And the reason that it's not only a principle, but it is also going to be very difficult to defend when this case eventually comes to the Supreme Court, as you know, uh, more than a dozen states have already launched lawsuits in this area. It's going to be difficult to defend because not only do they have the issue of you know indirect effects on interstate commerce, but they also have this problem. A person who chooses not to purchase insurance is not engaged in commerce at all. He's not engaged in any economic activity. In fact, the Raich decision and the Lopez decision talk about the Congress's ability to regulate economic activity. Well, here Congress is regulating economic inactivity and saying, get in the marketplace. Never has Congress done that, and never has the Supreme Court said you could regulate economic inactivity in the name of regulating interstate commerce. It's going to be a steep climb uh, for the U.S. Department of Justice to prove, you know, to establish to the court, even with this court, uh, even with uh, if Kagan is, uh, is confirmed replacing Stevens, which is not a prospect I relish, but um, it, you know it, it's still going to be a four to four decision, and then the fifth, vote, the ninth vote will be Justice Kennedy, uh, and it will depend on how Justice Kennedy sees the issue. I mean, it's, it's, it, I'm almost certain. Of that. And so that's where we are in Obamacare is clearly way beyond what the framers of this Constitution have been, in terms of what Congress can regulate. And in terms, it goes way beyond what the precedents, even the very liberal precedents after 1937, established. Yeah. But couldn't they argue that if you don't buy, then it affects the, uh, the pool of people that are buying insurance, therefore your inactivity affects interstate commerce? Yeah, that's, that's what they argue. Yeah, they'll say your inactivity um, yeah, because most of the people who don't buy are young people who are healthy. They say, yeah, they say, I'm 25 years old, I want to save my money, I'm healthy, I'll take risks, and if I ever get really sick, I'll go to mom and dad and they'll see if they'll take care of me. Or, you know, whatever, they, they, they make your, but it's a rational decision, right? It's a rational decision. I want to start a business, and I need to save my money. I'm, I'm young, and I'm going to do this. Lots of people have rational reasons. It's estimated there are 17 million people who have the 
ability to, to afford insurance but choose not to. And you're right, their decision not to purchase insurance does mean that the price of insurance is higher uh, for others because you've got this healthy pool of people who are not net contributors to the system. Um, and that's what the argument will be from Justice. They'll say that their, their inactivity affects interstate commerce, and that's not. But still, these past decisions say, well, you can regulate economic activity, not that you can regulate anything that doesn't have a substantial effect on commerce. Um, okay, I want to jump to the spending power. Now, the commerce power is incredibly dangerous, and it has been blown way beyond what the framework has been dangerous in the sense that if there are no limits that are, that are held carefully, uh, you could have the Leviathan grow beyond what the Constitution allows. The spending power is also one that you need to watch. Now, the spending power is found uh, right in the, uh, in the same section. Uh, it's in the first sentence of the Commerce Power on page 19. Congress will have the power to lay and collect taxes. taxes Which section? Um, Article 1, Section 8, on page 19. Shall have the power to lay and collect taxes uh, and, and provide for the common defense and general wealth of the United States. But all duties imposed on excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. So, collect taxes and basically provide for the common defense. In other words, to spend money and for the general welfare. To spend money for the general welfare and common defense of the United States. Okay. What if, in spending money for the welfare of the United States, Congress decides to attach some strings to that money? And Congress says, well, maybe we can do more than just spend the money. We can spend and then regulate while we're spending it. And this is where we have to come to the decision of South Dakota versus Dole, 1987. And I will always remember South Dakota versus Dole because it was a concerned an act passed by Congress in 1984. Uh, and if you, if you go back to 1984, you may remember that the, there was an organization called Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and there was a campaign across the nation to get states to raise their drinking ages. And you may remember that Kansas had a drinking age of 18, and, and it was there that we, that we had the origin of 3-2 beer rules in Kansas, right? You had 3-2 beer for 18, then we turned to 21. Uh, you had access to the, the liquors and uh, the stronger beer. And uh, different states have different rules, right? Oklahoma had a different rule, and uh, in, in, in Nebraska, Missouri, all had different rules. Okay, then this campaign got going, state by state, to get states to raise the drinking age to 21. And good arguments can be made on either side of that, whether it should or should not be done. Um, back then, uh, I, was, I turned 18 in 1984. So, you know, I had an opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as it happened, they grandfathered in. Congress did it this way. They said they actually acknowledged that well, we can't just force, them, we can't just regulate the states. There, there were still back then there were some limits in the minds of members of Congress, but they couldn't just tell the states what the drinking age had to be because there's been this history of this. It's a state issue. And so they said, if you want access to all the federal highway funds we have available, <laughs> and you and you don't want to lose five percent of your highway funds, you will establish a, a state drinking age of 21. And so they grandfathered it in. And so the people who turned 18 in uh, 1984 in Kansas were okay. Then the people who turned, nine, then became 19, and they were okay. Then they became 20, then they became 21. So I was in the group that got grandfathered in, and all the people in the class below me in high school were very, very bitter. Uh, <laughs>